This is CouncilCast, part of the Legal Talk Network, and I'm your host, Karen Conroy. When you face a complex case outside your expertise, you bring in a co-counsel for next-level results. When you want to engage, expand, and elevate your firm, you bring in a marketing co-counsel. In this podcast, I bring in marketing experts who each answer one big question to help your firm achieve more. Here's today's guest. Hi, my name is Katherine Smith. I'm the founder of Walton Birch, which is an e-commerce consulting firm based outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I help entrepreneurs and small businesses start and grow uh, websites and e-commerce stores. Hi, Katherine. Thank you for being here. This is going to be cool because uh, I, first of all, I love talking about technical stuff and I think e-commerce gets a little bit technical. Um, and so I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So, so thanks for coming and, and chatting with me today. Great. Thanks for having me. So today we are going to answer the big question, what does e-commerce look like for lawyers? Because I know that this is one area where lawyers instantly think, oh, no, no, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, I don't have a website that sells anything or... Um, you know, I don't, I don't have any products, and so e-commerce is, is not my thing. So, so let's start first with why, how could that possibly be wrong, and how does e-commerce apply to lawyers and law firm websites? That's a great question. And when I tell people that I'm an e-commerce consultant, the very first question that they ask is, so what does that mean? Yeah. Um, because when you think of e-commerce, you think of, oh, I'm selling art or candles or stickers or, you know, like a product online. Yeah. And so service providers or um, just people that don't sell products don't really think of themselves as uh, e-commerce merchants, if you will. Um, so for, for non-product businesses, I like to say that e-commerce is really anything with a payment gateway. Um, so, you know, e-commerce is the, the act of buying things online and um, or making payments online, I guess I'll say. Um, and that and that applies broadly to lots of different people. So for a, an attorney or, an, or a lawyer, that could mean um, accepting payments from a client or, you know, for retainers and things like that. That could mean um, selling uh, courses or online books or other digital downloads and things like that. So there's definitely opportunities for e-commerce for lawyers and attorneys and other services providers as well. Yeah, I've had a lot of clients who um, they have sort of backed into it for it, it, exactly in the way that you've described. They assume that this doesn't apply to them, that e-commerce literally means I need to have something that actually ships some physical product. Um, but then all of a sudden they're like, you know what, um, we have this we have this payment gateway and we want to uh, allow our, our clients to access their uh, payment and their invoices and all of that stuff through our website. And it's like, okay, well, now we're talking about a different thing on your website because there's some things that you need to think through when you're setting that up. So what are the different kinds of requirements that a website has when you're entering into that realm of e-commerce as, as opposed to when, when you don't have that, that piece of it? Yeah, that's a good point, or that's a good question. Um, a lot of people that I know are coming to e-commerce already operating, so they're not necessarily starting from scratch. So they may already have a system that does invoicing. They may already have a payment option, whether that's you know just like a PayPal or Stripe or some other sort of connection. Um, so when they're bringing, when they're coming to a website, they're saying, "Hey." I'm already operating here. I don't necessarily want to start over from scratch. I want to kind of use what I have and then integrate that into a website. Like, is that possible? Um, and with, you know, APIs and, um, you know, the technology available these days, it's absolutely possible. So uh, the question to ask is, hey, what am I using now that I'd like to continue using, whether that's an invoicing solution or a payment solution or even a customer portal, you know, a, a way that customers kind of log in and get their information. Um, you know, if, I, if you want to continue using those things, like how can I integrate them into my website in a way that makes that um, in a way that makes that setup seamless for me as a manager or as a merchant or as a business owner, but also seamless for my clients and customers and seamless for visitors to the website as well. 
Yeah. So what kinds of extra things, I mean, I keep thinking in terms of security, but what extra things do you need to make sure that, that you need to change or adjust or um, add to your site to, to be, have it become an e-commerce site? Oh, that's a good question. So security is definitely one of those things. Um, so a lot of the payment gateway solutions kind of come with the security. Okay. Um, so as you're setting up your website and your custom domain, just making sure that you have that it's called an SSL, which is a security certificate. Um, it's like the little lock <laughs> that shows up in your URL bar, um, you know, as people are going to your website. So making sure that you have an SSL attached to your website. Um, making sure that, um, you know, customer login pages are secured. And a lot of this kind of goes along with the platform that you build your website on. Um, only if you have a completely custom solution will you have to kind of worry about um, implementing these things yourself. But the making sure that, you know, you do have that security, um, you do have a actual payment gateway provider, and a lot of the existing payment uh, providers have just kind of options where you can connect that provider to a website. So PayPal has an option, like Stripe has an option where you can just connect an existing solution to a website um, and still have that be secure and have that client data and client information be secure as well. But from a, hey, I'd like to have a website. I'd like to make it uh, secure and I want to make sure that there's a payment gateway on it. Definitely making sure that at your server or hosting level, um, there is an SSL or some sort of security option. Um, and then aside from that, there are options for collecting customer information. So if you wanted to have a mailing list where customers can or um, clients can subscribe and get your newsletter or get updates or even get SMS text messaging, there are different, you know, plugins and uh, uh, platforms that you can use to capture that customer information. And so from a security perspective, that security certificate and some of those other, um, like they call them the CAPTCHA, which is basically the prove that you're human security yeah. efforts. Um, those things can be added to the websites as well. And they're, they're fairly easy to connect. They, it's, it's much easier to connect than it has been in the future. Um, but you know, if you just, uh, and I know that, uh, lawyers and attorneys are very cognizant of this, to, but to say, hey, I want to make sure that my customer information is secure. What types of things do I need? So that security certificate, um, kind of point of entry security features like that CAPTCHA, like that prove that you're human step, like things like that. Yeah. Um, and then secure platforms like Stripes and PayPal's and things like that. Those are important. Yeah. So I, I wanted to add two legal specific um things that so I know law pay is a is basically a, a bank and a payment processing um, system that lawyers use and it's specifically set up for okay. the way that the, the way that uh, law firms process payments and take into their accounting is is different than other industries and so law pay accounts for all of that mm -hmm. so that one I highly recommend um, also I know that Clio and other kind of um, legal software practice management software has connections to take um, payment processing in in as part of their their system as opposed to mm -hmm. I've had clients who literally uh, just connected on their website to their bank and this I don't uh, recommend where they had a, a form on the page within their domain where they were taking payments um, and it was such so problematic because it just kept getting hacked because it just didn't have enough security so what what does work is mm -hmm. if you have a link on the website and then it from that link it goes into the bank's website because the bank has all different levels of security on top of the SSL that prevents all that nasty mm -hmm. spam and and then it's also off your domain and so you you don't get hit with all that stuff um so those are just absolutely a few and things I've seen yeah, and just from a paperwork perspective, and I know I don't have to tell attorneys or lawyers this at all, um, but just from a, a paperwork and, and having receipts, literal and figurative receipts, yeah. um, being able to track those transactions and issue invoices and apply those payments to accounts, like having a system kind of around that is super helpful. So you don't necessarily want a naked 
payment gateway or a naked gateway to a bank just to process payments. You really just want to include that in your customer or client experience. And, you know, from a branding perspective, like having your logo on things and having things date (laughs) and time stamped and associated with the actual services being rendered is super helpful. So, yes, definitely a little bit of structure. Yeah. (laughs) Lots of security. (laughs) Yep. Um, So what kind of mistakes do you see people make with um, overall e-commerce, the way they set things up? Um, We were talking a lot about security, maybe security mistakes, but what kind of mistakes do you see that are kind of common in the way people do e-commerce with with their websites? Yes. So there are so many (laughs) website and e-commerce solutions available. Um, and the solutions vary based on what you're doing. So there are a lot of people out here that sell at marketplaces and pop-ups and, and basically in person, um, and their website is an extension of that. So, sure. um, you know, you, you have like an in-person presence, like a POS or point of sale system, and you have a website to go along with that. But for somebody who only has an online presence, like a, a platform that supports that point of sale service is a little bit overkill. So the, the thing that I see people kind of falter the most is just picking the wrong platform. Um, so it, is there a point of sale option? Do you need a point of sale option? Probably not. Yeah, <laughs> if you're yeah interested, most but, law firms, they're um, not going to ha- like actually hand over a credit card yeah. at, at your right. front office desk. It'll feel right. kind of awkward. <laughs> right. um, if you are selling, um, you know, apricots at a farmer's market, yeah, you're going to need that, you right. know, thing where you can swipe somebody's credit card right there. But yeah, I mean, you have to kind of right. think about who you're selling to and, and how that all kind of normally plays out. <laughs> As you said that, I thought about merch. Like, what if I opened my law firm and I just had like Smith Incorporated, <laughs> Smith and Partners, and I'm selling T-shirts. If I'm selling T-shirts in the lobby, then by all means, have a point of sale system. But it's kind of weird, probably but okay. But to, to just kind of add on to that. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Hey, to yeah. each his own. I'm not, you know, I won't knock yeah, it. I like, I, people buy all kinds of things these days. So I would not exactly. be surprised. Right. But, um... To, to kind of add on to that, the in terms of finding the right fit in a platform, um, some platforms require a lot more upkeep and updating than others. And so what you don't want to do is like knowing that you're super busy and you have a very heavy client load um, and you're not able to kind of spend a couple of hours per week on this website to pick a platform that requires a lot of attention and updates. Because as soon as something gets like unupdated, essentially, then you are at risk for hackers and security huge flaws problem. and things like yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are, do- especially if you're doing this yourself, especially if this is something that you want to manage yourself, make sure that the platform that you pick is one that can do some of those updates behind the scenes for you. Or if you just have all the free time in the world, pick <laughs> one that requires you to spend a lot of time on it but yeah. just make sure that you so what have platforms the right do you recommend Either i know you're way, a big sure i know you're a big fan right of shopify uh what what platforms do you recommend and then what platforms fit under that category of like they sound like they're just high maintenance Yes. So um, I, I recommend Shopify for product based. I mean, if you are selling merch in the lobby, then pla- Shopify is probably a great platform for you. Yeah. Um, the only other time I would recommend um, Shopify for a non product based business would be for um, maybe like digital downloads. So if you're selling courses or books or um, like something that can actually be shipped, then I think Shopify would potentially be a good platform. But for service providers, I think there are much better um, e-commerce centered platforms um, uh, that include some of the things that really uh, service providers need. So like lead generation and, um, you know, capturing information and doing the funnel things. And so um, for service providers, I actually think that there's a platform called Kartra, which is a really good platform as a standalone option and also as one that can be embedded in an existing website oh, cool. um, that takes all of the technical things kind of out of it. I am not sponsored in any way. Let me just say that. I know. I, <laughs> no, speaking of disclaimers, yeah. not sponsored. <laughs> yeah. I am not like. <laughs> no, but it's good not, to know because. I just there, worked with a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are so many different <laughs> options out there. So, um, so what are the, what are the ones on the, on the other side of the list that you, that you don't recommend that are kind of high maintenance? Cause I, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but I'm curious to hear. 
Yes, I know. Like, I really just, I, as a person who has built her own website on WordPress, I do not recommend WordPress for people who are very pressed for time. Okay. Um, just because it is, as an open source platform, um, there are compatibility issues with yeah. the different things. So it's really great. The strength of WordPress is also the weakness of WordPress. Yeah. The strength is, hey, you can basically get a lot of functionality from lots of different places through this open source framework. But that means that all of those things have to be constantly updated to remain compatible with each other. And the yeah. biggest challenge that I've seen even for me personally, as someone who builds websites for a living, is keeping that compatibility up to date. And as things change, um, making sure that they still work very well together. So yeah. unless you moonlight as a web designer or yeah. you just have an abundance of free time or the budget to hire someone to kind of really pay attention to this and keep it updated, I would not necessarily recommend um, WordPress for like a solopreneur or someone who's operating a very small office and doesn't just have resources to dedicate to um, the maintenance and updates for a WordPress site. Yeah, we we do solely WordPress sites, but when we, uh, and then we have a lot of clients who are uh, use our maintenance plan and the clients who have e-commerce sites, it's significantly more expensive for exactly the reasons that you're describing. Mm -hmm. What we're doing Absolutely. on a regular basis for those websites is a ridiculous amount of more time than the sites that, that are not e-commerce. And so we have to, and, mm -hmm. and the fact that like, when these yep. things break or aren't quite, you know, updated within the first three minutes, um, thing things start to fall apart, and that's their sales. So you you have to be on top of this stuff mm -hmm. very regularly. So I really, if if you have a WordPress site, which most firms, uh, you know, I, I'd say the majority of firms' websites are built on WordPress, you really have to have someone managing it and maintaining it and keeping up with it Absolutely. um and it shouldn't really Absolutely. be in somebody who's who's a lawyer or someone inside your law firm you need an expert doing this because you're you're yes. at the next level of technical requirements for a website at this point Absolutely. And like just having that not go right opens you up to just a lot of risk. And I know that <laughs> lawyers are risk averse. Like this is not, that's not something that you should want to do. Like stay in yeah. your lane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do what you do I feel well, like that's, which is yeah, protect and that's people just something from risk. To know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's something to know going in. If you're building, yep. if you're adding an e-commerce element to your site, you are taking it to this next level and it really is going to require a babysitter basically and so make sure you get that babysitter mm -hmm. who knows what they're doing so that it doesn't create yep. this giant mess for you because hacking a regular website is one thing but hacking an e-commerce website is is next level messy right i mean i don't want to i don't want to talk people out of it because yeah. i think that a website done really well can be an asset for your business it's yeah. almost like an extra person or an extra kind of staff arm of your business that can help you manage things like onboarding customers and clients yes. and um, you know, submitting trouble tickets or doing billing and payments and providing help documents and things like that and like um, statuses on things that you're working on for them. And I think that that takes a lot of the person power out of running a business. However, there is a, there is some attention that needs to be paid to that. So if you kind of consider that it is essentially a salaried part of your business, I think that's it's a lot easier to kind of manage and think about that way. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, to take care of it, make sure that you recognize that there's a little more that goes in here and, um, you know, take care of that. So, um, all right, right. So it is time for the book recommendation. So, Catherine, let, let us know uh, what is the book that you are going to recommend? I know you've got an interesting one to talk about. And, you know, our lawyers yes. are so busy that they really just want to spend time reading the books that are that are worthwhile. So so what's the book that you have that you read that that you want to recommend? That's really funny. So I, I, I do a, a lot of reading, but not a lot of e-commerce reading. So a lot of not books anyway. Sure. Um, so a lot of the books that I've been reading recently are either memoirs or kind of like historical based books. And one that I read recently that I really think was a good book was called Girly Drinks. Um, and it was about the history of um, basically women in the alcohol industry because there's Ooh. not a lot of visibility. And women have been operating behind the scenes for hundreds, if not thousands of years when it comes to like drinking and yeah. the culture associated with that. And I think that that's a really good book to read. Books like that are really good to read to understand 
how we've gotten to where we are as a culture, as an industry, as a society. Um, and, you know, who were those people that have been overlooked? You're like, ah, oh, yes. women didn't get into brewing. And you're like, no, nah, women have been brewing for a while. Yes. So it was very, that book specifically, extremely entertaining as an audio book and also as a book as well. There's some recipes in it. Oh, cool. Um, and informative. And, and really, it's just really helpful to kind of understand, like, how women have been operating behind the scenes and helped us have, get to where we are oh, as a culture, uh, as a drinking culture, and and made, honestly, some breakthroughs in that industry. So I really like that book, and um, it's called Girly Drinks, um, and books like that that really just help you kind of understand, like, the history behind the history. I feel like that's so inspiring for entrepreneurs because, and, and especially women entrepreneurs, because mm-hmm. uh, in so many ways, a lot of us feel like we're blazing these new trails and, you know, there's, there's not, when you look to business books, it's 90% written by men. And mm-hmm. um, so I, I actively seek out business books written by women and it's not super easy to find. It's basically like lean in like Sheryl Sandberg, who's a billionaire and I don't really relate to her on any level. Like <laughs> I didn't have a similar yeah. you know, career path as she did. Um, yeah. And so like, she's got some good things to say, but these, these kinds of books are cool because it's like, okay, who are these people who have been overlooked, who are behind the scenes, but who are really driving the course of this industry and the business and everything. And like, what lessons can we learn from, you know, the things that they did? That, that sounds amazing. We will obviously link to that book in the show notes. It'll, and it'll be okay. added to our library, but that sounds like an awesome awesome uh thing plus I love I love it when they're a little bit entertaining too like that's that that always adds a little extra oh it's very entertaining <laughs> yeah. yep. so Catherine what's one thing that you know that works consistency oh, um, that's consistency a good one. is the thing like just generally in business but also in e- e-commerce I get so many people who come to me and say, hey, I built this website and nobody's coming to it. And you're yes. just like, hey, have you told anybody about it? And they're like, no. And it's like, hey, have you put any new content out there? And they're like, no. <laughs> so in the same way that you show up for your business every day, in the same way that you get up and, you know, put on your shoes and leave the house if you leave the house or, you know, go and sit down in front of that computer Work on your website like a just another part of your business and show up consistently. So create new content. Yes. You know, if you um, want to be a thought leader, be a thought leader and show up consistently in that. And I've seen that work. And it's yeah. not, you know, necessarily overnight viral success, you know, like um, some, some people online. But um, over time, it will pay off. It will pay dividends. And so if you, I, I tell that to my clients and I say, you, you just have to trust me on that. You just yeah. got to show up consistently and keep doing it and it gets easier but it also uh, you get more traction there's definitely a tipping point yeah I think this idea of the overnight success is um, it's just such a unicorn but everybody assumes that's how everyone else made it and it's like yeah yeah, it was like a 10-year overnight uh, success you know like I spent 10 years and then all of a sudden boom one thing kind of took off and did really well But there was 10 years of trying a lot of other things before that that didn't do so well or that that they did well and whatever. But all of a sudden, now you're aware of me and you you somehow think that was an overnight success. But most of the time, that's not the case. Absolutely. I I made the joke recently that my... um return on struggle my ROS was about three years oh that's so good I love that the return on struggle that's that is so good because I feel like people really downplay the amount of struggle that goes into success and so you kind of just have to own that and recognize okay I'm going to work through this like any exercise or any other thing And we assume that when we want to get fit and exercise or whatever, we're going to have to struggle and sweat and kind of, and and that's just part of the process. And it's like, okay, most of life is actually kind of like that. (laughs) You know, like there's going to be some kind of struggle in, in some way, but people want to fast track that. And I feel like in, especially in SEO clients where they're like, okay, if I hire you today, how many minutes is it going to take before, you know, it's like, okay, you need to take a deep breath and step back. That's just not how it's going to work. Right. Yeah. Right. And 
Right. It's it's really difficult to see that unless you're able to literally draw a direct line between the inputs and the outputs. And that's why I joke that it was three years, because some of the opportunities that are coming up for me now are based on things I literally did two and a half to three yes. years ago. Yes. So it's just like, oh, I did that like two years like Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So the return on struggle period for me is about three years. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's I love that. That's that's such a great takeaway um and just kind of a good way to for people to to take that step back recognize that these things take time and to Mm -hmm. try to find some patience with the whole process absolutely yeah so what's one big takeaway that you want listeners to get from this episode there's so many good little nuggets that we have through throughout the whole episode that we talked about but what's that's what's one big one that you'd like people to kind of walk away with um that that e-commerce is everything. <laughs> like everything yeah. is e-commerce, I guess is a better way to say that. So this is not, hey, I'm selling t-shirts online. This is, hey, I'd like to do business in a very modern way, um, you know, in, in the way of the future or the way, the modern way to really just uh, make it a seamless experience for my clients, for my customers and for myself, um, you know, as a professional part of my business and as a reinforcement of my brand, like e-commerce, like my business is an e-commerce business, even if I do not sell products in the traditional sense of e-commerce. Oh, I think that's so good. And it's just a way of, I mean, mm. you're you're taking payments in a traditional way. Like there's, you have a process for that, hopefully, of, you know, finding, invoicing mm-hmm. your clients and whatever. And this is just a way to bring it mm-hmm. and expand it and bring it online. And, mm-hmm. um, but then also consider all that security and all of the, you know, all the kind of necessary pieces that you need to add in to, to take care of it. Absolutely. Um, but I think that's, that's so interesting. And I, uh, really appreciate this conversation because I really do think this is going to be a light bulb moment for for a lot of listeners that are like, oh, wait a second, maybe not. Like they kind of take a little left turn in their thinking. It's going to be cool. interesting to hear from people. Yeah, uh, that's so- cool. Awesome. So Catherine Smith is a business consultant and obviously e-commerce expert. Thank you so much for this conversation and for being here today. I I think there's so much good, awesome value that people are going to get out of it. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the CouncilCast podcast. Be sure to visit our website at council-cast.com for the resources mentioned on the episode and to give us your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate if you could rate and review the podcast on Apple and subscribe to your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next one.